if you came to the study of democracy in Africa today with a completely blank mind, if you were a new student taking the class for the very first time, or if you were an alien dropped onto Earth from another planet, you would be confused by two, what I see as being fairly diametrically opposed positions on the position and state of democracy in Africa today. One we might roughly characterize as Afro-pessimism, or one we might roughly characterize as Afro-positivism. What do the Afro-pessimists say? They have a very good argument about why democracy not only doesn't work in Africa, but probably is not feasible in Africa at all. So this isn't just a position that democracy is struggling, it's that it will inherently struggle for years to come. They would say that elections in Africa have only ever been a fig leaf for hiding authoritarian regimes, a way in which recalcitrant authoritarian leaders have managed to gain international legitimacy without actually reforming. They would point to us, and this is an important fact that many people in the room might not be aware of, that today the most stable form of regime in the world is an authoritarian leader who runs very tightly controlled elections. In other words, authoritarian leaders that allow elections in their countries achieve a greater level of political stability than those that don't. It tells us something very important about the use of elections as legitimating devices, both for the flow of international aid and for domestic and international legitimacy. They would point out to you that the democracies in Africa, whether you rank them by Freedom House, Polity or some other index, are no better at representing women than the authoritarian systems. One of the highest countries in the world for female representation is Rwanda. One of the lowest is Botswana. They sit at opposite ends of the democracy spectrum. They would also point out to you that elections have been responsible for violence across Africa. They would say even in democratic Ghana, we have seen 10 to 50 people die in <coughs> contestations, often around traditional leadership disputes in the run-up to elections. Even in Benin, which we talk about as being a democracy, we have reports of opposition people being regularly beaten up and in some cases tortured around the early 1990s elections. In other words, even the elections that you don't see in the headlines suffer violence. They would also point out that in another of, uh, number of countries, presidents are relatively untamed. These are presidents, think of Museveni in Uganda, Kagame in Rwanda, who not only control their political system in a fairly dominant way, they are able to give themselves third terms almost at will. And they would point out that if you use almost any measure of the quality of civil liberties in Africa over the last five years, they have declined, not risen, as the number of multi-party systems has gone up. In other words, there is no straightforward correlation between free elections in Africa as a constitutional right and civil liberties and political freedoms as an actual lived reality. It's a pretty strong Afro-pessimist case. But the reason you would be confused if you were my alien or my first year school student is that there's an equally strong argument for exactly the opposite position. And that argument goes like this. Look, We've had transfers of power in recent years in countries where we previously thought it was unthinkable. The dominant PDP government in Nigeria has fallen for the first time. We've seen transfers of power in places like Kenya, where Moy and Kanu were removed in 2002. In Zambia, where a populist opposition leader overcame all odds to win power in 2011. Not only that, academic research by Stefan Lindbergh has argued that the more elections are held, the better the quality of civil liberties in those countries, and that after three elections are held, we get a kind of lock-in effect where the quality of democracy increases significantly and the prospects of democratic breakdown reduce markedly. We see gradual gains in opposition parties across the continent, including in former dominant authoritarian states. Senegal is a classic example where gradual improvements for the opposition finally led to a transfer of power. Our friends in Tanzania are hoping that they're in the middle of the same process, having just recorded their most successful election result ever. We would also point, if we were an Afro-positivist, uh, to the fact that the support for democracy in Africa is high and has remained high, despite its many failings. If you look at Afro-barometer data, 70 to 80 percent of Africans in most countries support term limits. Roughly the same percentage support democracy over other forms of government. So support for democracy amongst Africans, something that is often questioned by Afro-pessimists, is actually pretty high. There's also really interesting evidence about constitutionalism in Africa and how leaders are selected. 
There's a lovely graph by two of my colleagues called Dan Posner and Dan Young. And what they graph is how African leaders leave power. And they look at this from the 60s all the way to today. In the 1960s, 80% of African leaders left power unconstitutionally. Unconstitutionally here means a revolution, a war, assassination. Today, over 80% of leaders leave power constitutionally through resignation, through term limits, through elections, or through death in office. The transformation in the way that power is exchanged in Africa has been real and dramatic. They would also show, and my own research has shown, that term limits, despite the fact that they are occasionally flouted in a Uganda and potentially in a Rwanda, are actually starting to bite. 36 heads of state have faced a two-term limit between 1990 and 2015 in Africa. 20, that's the majority, accepted the limit and voluntarily resigned. 16 did not. They either ignored it or they tried to change the constitution to get a third term. Of those 16, 11 were successful, 5 were not successful. In other words, only 11 of 36 leaders have managed to get out of presidential term limits since the democratisation of the continent in the early 1990s. And significantly, no leader has ever gone against term limits in a country where another leader has already respected them. In other words, where term limits respected once, they have never been rejected by a subsequent leader. The countries in which we see people removing term limits are those countries in which no president has ever yet respected them. All of this tells a much more positive story about the continent, a story of institutional strengthening, a story of a continent in which term limits are being respected, presidents are leaving power increasingly through the rules of the game. And as those of you who've heard me talk before will know, term limits are particularly important because when the ruling party does not run its existing president as a candidate in the elections, its likelihood of winning those elections drops from 85% to 50%. In other words, the chance of winning for the ruling party drops from overwhelming to 50-50 when they can't run a ruling, when they can't run the existing president, the sitting president. There were lots of reasons for this. Generational change, changes of ethnicity between the different presidential candidates, the problem of secession within ruling parties, which often causes party splits, the difficulty of the new candidate gaining the same kind of patronage resources as his outgoing predecessor. We can talk about those in Q&A. But the outcome is very clear. The average vote share for ruling parties when they run a sitting president is 59%. When they're not allowed to run a sitting president, it's 45% from an absolute majority to a second round. And we know how dangerous second rounds are for presidents because they can generate opposition unity to get the 40, 55% of the vote needed to vote them out. Other figures are also very dramatic. So term limits are important because they create opportunities for opposition victories. Not a certainty, just a 50-50 window. That is then important because where we see transfers of power in Africa, we often see a massive swing in popular support for democracy. Countries that have seen a transfer of power in the year afterwards typically see 20% surge in support for the principle of democratic government. So the Afro-positivists have an also very compelling story. Holding elections seems to make countries more democratic over time. Respecting term limits gets rid of leaders, getting rid of leaders creates more free and fair elections, opposition victories produces higher levels of democratic support. All of this creates a virtuous cycle. So, my task in the next two minutes is to explain to you how these two competing views of Africa can be held together. And the answer, of course, as all of you will already have guessed, because you're Africa experts, is there's not one Africa. And the story of democracy in Africa, as we speak today, is the story in a sense of a continent growing apart. Each of these stories is true, it's just true for a different set of countries. Let me explain why. It is true that politics on the continent is becoming more competitive. It's amazing and people often forget that there have been 27 transfers of power in Africa since the early 1990s. So despite all of the doom and gloom, we have seen turnovers in Benin, Cape Verde, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Madagascar, Malawi, Mali, 
Mauritius, Niger, Nigeria, Sao Tome, Senegal, Sierra Leone and Zambia. Not all of those countries are still on the democratic straight and narrow, of course. We have seen two turnovers, which political scientists amongst you will know that Samuel Huntington once said was the true sort of mark of a consolidated democracy. In Benin, <coughs> Cape Verde, Ghana, Madagascar, Malawi, Mauritius, Senegal and Zambia. That's quite a lot of progress in a very small but significant number of countries. So how do we disaggregate the continent? If we want to stop talking about Africa but talk about Africa's, what are the different pathways we see? I'm going to sketch out three here. So I'm going to leave aside those countries that have no effective government, places like Somalia for the second. And I'm going to just talk about three clear categories of states that I see which have three clear trajectories. And these trajectories map on to some extent to what I was just saying. We have a first group of states for which the more positive interpretation is most clearly true. Countries like Benin, Ghana, Mauritius, Senegal, South Africa, where you can clearly see that repeatedly holding elections has improved the quality of civil liberties, created greater opportunities for the opposition, led to a process of democratic consolidation. Countries in which term limits are being respected and they are helping to create a culture of politics in which the formal rules of the (coughs) game are respected. These are the countries in which we are likely to see democratic consolidation continuing, leading to better economic governance, more inclusive government, more effective democratic institutions over time. These are the set of Africa's leading lights. That said, and I think this is important to flag, whilst we should expect that trajectory to continue, and there's good academic evidence that it will, we should also be aware that some of those countries are more shallow in their democratic roots than we might believe. And Mali here and the collapse of Mali in 2014 is a very good reminder to us that even in countries like Benin that have a very high quality of democracy, the roots of democracy in society may be relatively shallow. There's a second set of countries which doesn't share that positive outlook. This is a set of countries in which elections have been particularly conflictual. Countries like Zimbabwe, countries like Kenya. What we see in these countries typically is a kind of cycling. We see the opposition doing better, 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 till they get to about 45%. And in the election where they might win, the ruling party whips out the rug and says, we're not so sure we're comfortable with that, right? This is Kenya 2007. This is Zimbabwe, where the MDC effectively wins the election and ZANU say, actually, we're not prepared to go. And these are the places in which elections appear to be a fig leaf. These are the places where people get fed up or frustrated with democracy in Africa, where they lose faith in the project. What are we likely to see in these cases? I think in these cases we should expect to see, in many cases, a continual cycling. What we need to break out of the kind of contested world in which these cases are operating is sufficient trust to develop between the parties, either for the incumbent president to respect term limits, leaving office and creating that opportunity for an opposition victory, or for the ruling party to actually accept defeat and transfer power. But this is particularly unlikely in these countries, because in many of these countries there have been historical crimes against humanity and there have been historical corruption. And incumbents are afraid that if they leave power, they will be persecuted or prosecuted by those who will replace them. So building trust is the key in these cases, to prevent people from holding on to power, not because they desperately want power, but as a mechanism of self-defense. So what should we expect here? We should expect continual cycling. We should expect the countries that can build that trust and stronger institutions to exit this group and converge on the first group that I mentioned. But we should also expect that for many countries, they may be stuck in this group for the next 10 years. The implication of this, of course, is very important. It means that the democratic gap in African states is going to rise. Some states are going to increasingly look like consolidated democracies, with others stuck roughly where they are now. There's a third set of states, of course, and this is where I'll kind of wrap up and end, which is the states in which we actually see fairly solid authoritarian regimes using elections as a device of legitimation. These are countries like Ethiopia, countries like Rwanda. These are places in which the opposition doesn't get more than 10% in the election. I think it's true that in the recent round of discussions in Rwanda about changes that might allow the president to have a third term, 10 people were found in the public consultation to have disagreed with this proposal. Now, my (coughs) sense is either this was a very brave 10 people or they made up a nice round number so it looked like somebody had disagreed because zero is not believable, right? 
So these are the countries that give Africa a bad name when it comes to democracy. And these countries look to be relatively stable, and they are. Remember what I said earlier, statistically, these are the countries that, in the world that are actually the most stable. They're much more stable than authoritarian regimes that don't hold elections at all. But, although that's true of these cases, and therefore, again, we should see this divergence between the top set of cases and this category, it's also important to remember that some of these regimes are much weaker and more shallow than they first appear. In Ethiopia, every glimmer of democratic governance is met with an opposition victory in the capital. In Burkina Faso, where we thought we had a stable authoritarian regime, the attempt of the president to get an unpopular third term triggered public demonstrations that led to his downfall. So in countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, Cameroon, it's not unthinkable that we will miss a level of public opposition that will cause political instability in the near term. Again, we shouldn't anticipate or read off from a lack of revolutionary activity that the political system is actually stable. So what does this all mean about what we should do as international actors, as you know, the donor community, as democracy promotion community, as academics? To what extent can these things be shaped from the outside? There are three factors that seem to really determine where countries fit into the three categories that I talked about today. One is histories of violence. One of the things that marks countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia is that they're essentially civilian governments that evolved out of rebel movements or military forces. They are, in a sense, military leaders wearing civilian clothes. That generates a very different type of politics to the countries that are in that first category, which are predominantly states that were former one-party states or civilian regimes. So one is the history of conflict and violence. The second is the strength of political institutions, as I talked about before, where term limits are respected, where presidents are willing to allow their electoral commissions to be more independent. And the third, of course, is resources. We know that, you know, perhaps with the arguable exception of Nigeria, and now, of course, Ghana, there are no oil democracies in Africa. One of the highest correlations in the world is, you know, in political science is between being authoritarian and having high levels of oil resources. Of those three, what can we affect as an international community? We can't affect natural resources, really. In fact, we often play into the problem. In places like Nigeria, our thirst for resources have often blinded us to the shortcomings of the government. So it's probably not there that we're going to have an impact. We may have some impact on histories of violence. In the DRC, we managed to get a good election off the ground as a team of international community and African actors, including good leadership by the South Africans, investing a billion dollars in peacekeepers to allow that election to happen. So the international community can have a role to play here, but again, we've got to be realistic. The problem in the DRC was that that level of engagement couldn't be maintained. When it was withdrawn, the DRC suffered a damaging slide back to authoritarian government. So we can engage in these areas, and if you think about places like Liberia, we have been involved in Sierra Leone in important transformational peace-building exercises, but there's a limited capacity to do this over a long period of time. Stronger institutions, then, is probably the one of these three things that is the area in which we find it easiest to engage. Support for term limits, pressure on presidents to respect them, supports for civil society actors to engage around term limits and increase the domestic support for them is something that seems to be an area where the international community can both engage, it's high profile, it's relatively easy, it's a relatively straightforward issue, and is something which can actually have a significant impact on democratisation. But to end very quickly, I think then one of the things we need to think about is exactly where the international community sits on African democracy. On the one hand, there's a myth that China has emerged out of nowhere to disrupt a happy consensus that we had on promoting democracy in Africa. But as all of you who have watched democracy in Africa since the early 1990s know, there was never such a happy consensus. French activities in places like Rwanda, British sensitivities about their areas of influence, similar practices by other donors, all give the lie to the idea that we were always all together in the democracy project. It was always more complicated than that, well before China came along. And you can see this if you look at the responsibility, the relationship between places like Nigeria, the United States, the UK and China. 
These are the kind of places where China is most heavily engaged in Africa, the places in which it gains most of its resources. But these are also the places that historically we've been very happy to engage because of the importance of the natural resources without being particularly critical. Consider, for example, the UK and American response to the 2000 elections in Nigeria. Most people don't believe they were really elections. They were described by observation teams as election type events because they bore so little relation to elections. I believe that the official monitoring report on the Nigerian elections is one of the longest reports ever written. What did the British and the Americans do? Not very much because at the time the US government had a priority to diversify its oil supply away from the Middle East. Nigeria is providing 22% of US crude. So the impact of China here and the ability of us to shape things isn't related simply to the fact that China comes in and doesn't have conditionality, the Chinese are willing to deal with anybody come what may. The problem is that it's always been a very complex multipolar world. All of these governments have historically had different interests that have been there and present and distorted their support for democracy. China's involvement in Africa makes that picture even more complicated, but doesn't necessarily actually change it radically. So, the final line, there is no democracy in Africa, but there are democracy in Africa's. There are three Africa's, one which is racing ahead and for which we can be very excited. One which is stuck in a turbulent middle ground and could go either way. One which is stuck in an authoritarian backwater and may remain so for the next 10 years. The trajectory of the continent then is not one of convergence, but one of divergence. It's one where international communities can play a significant role but perhaps more at the margins. We shouldn't expect tremendous change as a result of outside processes. As we know from Afghanistan and Iraq, as much as we do from Sudan and Somalia, it is domestic factors that shape the success of democratization. <laughs>